Thank you very much, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. And I was asked to talk about the role of the sperm in facilitating, uh, in the facilitation of fertilization. And I wanted to dissect my title a little bit, because facilitation means to, to help, to improve, or to make something easier. And um, without being too chauvinistic, although uh, sperm are one of my top two favorite gametes, um, <laughs> the, um, the sperm does more than just facilitate. And, and I don't know if the title is a reflection of our society. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm incredibly sensitive to the Me Too movement. I think there have been horrible inequities. And, and it's remarkable what a century can do because the great reproductive physiologist, Jacques Loeb, wrote a paper in 1916, How the Sperm Saves the Life of the Egg. And so you can see that we've come a full 180 degrees about now, well, it's just facilitating, um, you know, as if it's dispensable. Um, but let's move on. And what I want to do in particular is make this talk somewhat relevant for all of us in the days of ICSI. And I think it's really important to distinguish what happens during ICSI versus what happens during what we think is natural fertilization, or IVF, and it's really quite remarkable because in, in ICSI, a, a, an embryologist or andrologist is looking down a microscope and decides w which, which sperm to use. Now, I can ask the women in the room, you know, who is the, the most attractive stud muffin in here? And I'm sure they're all going to agree it's Brian Herman, but... But, you know, when you look down a microscope and you see a sperm, there might be some discussion, and no one really knows what is it that selects the one sperm that's going to... I'm sorry, Brian, he's uh, blushing now. Um, <laughs> but what is it that selects the one sperm uh, to get into the egg? And, and we really don't have much information. And let me remind you also that we are conducting an enormous uh, experiment. So many of our clinics are going to either ICSI only or ICSI primarily. And we're now getting the earliest data on the men who are reaching reproductive age who were the first um, ICSI-conceived boys. And some of that data is a little worrisome, that, that their sperm counts are significantly lower than um, the general population. Now... Maybe the earliest ICSI cases were Y-chromosome microdeletions or very severe male factor. Maybe using ICSI for um, men who don't have male factor problems won't, won't result in, in worrisome concerns, but we don't really know that. And let me remind you that ICSI doesn't absolutely mirror the events during um, natural fertilization. There are a number of, of steps in, in sort of the, the hurdles of conception that ICSI circumvents. We get around a number of those early, early things. And one of the things that happens when the sperm facilitates the process of fertilization is that a match is ignited. And that match is the activation of the egg by the sperm. And you can see that in real time here when you're looking at a wave of calcium that's starting at the site of sperm entry. And within about 30 seconds or so, this wave of calcium, sort of like a brush fire, spreads all across the egg. And that egg is forever changed. I mean, the Sleeping Beauty uh, motif, I think, is very apt because now it's been you know, given that kiss of life, and, and it is forever changed. And indeed, there are some clinics that are proposing the use of ionomycin, or A23187, to artificially activate eggs that aren't activated after ICSI, and I know there have been some clinical successes. 
um, I want to speak about a different structure, and John Zhang already mentioned this, that we always think of our mitochondria as coming from our mom, and yet colleagues here in China and Taiwan um, and also in the States just demonstrated the biparental inheritance of mitochondrial DNA. This just came out in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And so a lot of times what we think we know may not necessarily um, be absolutely accurate in all cases. And there, it had been previously known there were some neurological um, disorders where there was paternal inheritance of sperm. But here, uh, again, there's paternal mitochondrial inheritance. The other thing that the sperm has is the acrosome reaction. And if you will permit me um, to, to be your model sperm for the day, this talk will be seminal. Um, and when the sperm comes in the egg, the sperm <laughs> has a little acrosome or a good-sized acrosome on it. It's, I got this in Egypt. It's not a keeper. But um, <laughs> when the sperm comes into the egg, normally the acrosome is, uh, is lost at the surface of the uh, plasma membrane. And yet after ICSI, at the components of the acrosome remain on the male pronucleus or the sperm nucleus for quite a long time, and the first DNA sy synthesis cycle is, um, is, is uh, delayed. There are other proteins that also remain on the sperm, and it's quite remarkable because the sperm nucleus now needs to swell and become a male pronucleus, and if you look at the nuclear envelope, you can see there are some nuclear pores over here. There are the two nuclear membranes. But the whole decondensation of the nuclear envelope is, is, um, is asynchronous after ICSI versus after IVF. And there's a structure that's found inside of many, many oocytes, including human oocytes, that's called the annulet lamellae. And the annulate lamellae are stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of nuclear pores that are preassembled in the unfertilized egg, and then they're, they're used to make the new nuclear envelope for all the blastomere nuclei. And it may well be that specific RNA are stuffed into these nuclear pores that allow various transcripts to be released at a particular time. And for those of you that don't know a whole lot about nuclear structure, nuclear structure is very important. Um, there are some diseases like progeria where these children look like 90-year-old men and in some cases these are caused by defects in the nuclear lamins. The nuclear lamins are kind of the, the skeletal structure that's found underneath the nuclear membranes and they break down every meiosis or mitosis and they reassemble. And they're highly dynamic structures. So here is a video of annual lamellae merging with a uh, blastomere nucleus. And you can see this is just a few seconds. And they also are developmentally regulated. So there's one class of nuclear pores that are found in um, the, uh, under maternal control and another class that's found under zygotic control. And I want to tell you about a new type of organelle that you may not necessarily have heard of, but again, going back to my hippie roots, I'll remind you about lava lamps. You know, lava lamps were these two waxes that would go and move on the basis of heat, and I hope you never break one because I did once, and it was really waxy and a mess. But there's a new type of organelle that's being referred to as proteinaceous membraneless organelles. So these are not organelles like mitochondria. These are not organelles like chloroplast. These are organelles that don't have any membranes around them, but they're all over our cells. These are organelles that aggregate at one time of the cell cycle and disaggregate at another type of time of the cell cycle. And so nuclear pores, uh, the nucleolus, there are a number of structures that we now recognize as, uh, as forming because of phase differences that the particles aggregate and then they disaggregate. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about these because the absence of disaggregation leads to horrible societal and horrible 
um, ne uh, neurological problems. The inability to dissociate tau or senilins or presenilins or amyloid causes um, Alzheimer's disease. The inability to dissociate synucleins causes Parkinson's disease. And there are other ones that cause other types of dementias. And, um, and for the young people in the room, you really need to slow down the rate of dementia among us baby boomers because otherwise it's going to cost you a fortune. I mean, one of the reasons I think that China has relaxed this, the one-child policy is because you need more people to take care of me and Sherman. I mean, there just aren't enough young people. And, you know, you better get on the, on the ball and slow down dementia because otherwise you won't send your kid to, to private schools. I mean, this is a big societal issue. And actually, it's, uh, it's worse in China than any place else because the one-child policy has meant that many of the young people may have two parents to support and four grandparents. So you have an upside-down demographic pyramid, but that's a, a, a story not for today. But another organelle that is one of these membraneless proteinaceous organelles that aggregates and disaggregates is my favorite organelle, the centriole. And we're now learning so much about the centriole by understanding these phase shifts. So these are not organelles where you can find DNA or RNA and trace them that way. Instead, they're like um, Legos that are crystallized. And just recently, in a large collaboration, we discovered an atypical centriole found in human sperm. And this is really kind of cool, because at the base of the human sperm, there's a... Um, a, a, a vault, there, there's, um, th there's like a basket-like structure in which there are very special proteins, and, and it doesn't look like a typical centriole. It's an unusual centriole, but it's found in e every sperm, and later when the sperm enters the egg, you can find these two structures at 90 degrees to one another in a typical way that centrioles behave. And we now know, because of the molecular dissection of centrioles, how the centrioles are destroyed during spermatogenesis, and also how centrioles are reformed in the zygote. And so literally, this is an area where Lego modeling works very well in terms of um, having interchangeable pieces that at mitosis or meiosis you can reassemble and uh, put them together. Now, I've told you in the past how the sperm brings in the two centrioles that then later um, form the poles of the mitotic spindle. And this is a human egg. They both were human. And this is one where two sperm entered, and each sperm brought two centrioles. So you end up with four centrioles in this human sperm. But very recently, we've answered the question, what happens to the egg centriole? Because in oogenesis, you're supposed to lose the egg centriole. And through a series of complicated imaging and complicated genetics, we can actually show that the centrioles in the egg never are really lost. They are just tiny structures that people couldn't find because they truly are needles in a haystack. I mean, you can see the two green dots over there. And you can find them already in the primordial germ cells. And the, the female centrioles persist forever. And the implications of these female centrioles are, are, are not not entirely clear, but the egg does have the remnants of a centriole, and the sperm brings in an extra centriole. And, um, and we recently reported on this. And I did want to mention that religion influences us and has influenced this field forever. For example, Leeuwenhoek, when he discovered sperm, he investigated only what without sinfully defiling himself, remains as a residue after conjugal coitus, right? I mean, he needed to have coverage so that the church didn't bust him. I mean, you know, he found the sperm, but it was all halal or kosher. I mean, there was no, nothing funny going on there. Now, when I look at the audience, I mean, I, I look at Kyle Orwig, I look at Pasquale, and it makes me think about the epididymis. You know, I, I, I was going to write a paper about how the epididymis is the least understood 
um, organ in a man, and my wife said, no, 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 there's a different organ that isn't very well understood in men. But, um, but you know, the epididymis is three times longer than a man is tall. The epididymis of a stallion is between 80 and 100 meters long. I mean, these are enormous organelles. And poor little sperm, I mean, it finally makes its way out of the testis. And now it has to schlep its way down this organelle, I mean, this organ, and it has to do that within a week to 10 days. I mean, it's an amazing journey. They say it's the equivalent of a guy walking from New York to San Francisco in about a week. I mean, you know, look. The sperm has it hard enough. I mean, okay, you know, I have a Y chromosome. But, I mean, you know, it's crazy. And yet we know so little about the epididymis. And recently, one thing that we showed is that as the sperm moves down the epididymis, I'm going to actually show it here, the pair of centrioles first is reduced to one centriole and then later becomes an undetectable centriole. So there's a lot going on in the epididymis. Don't think that just because a sperm is released from the testis that the, um, the, uh, the, the sperm is fully remodeled. And it brings up a topic that is a controversial topic, and it's the topic of whether or not nightmares can be inherited. Because this whole field of epigenetics is lively and debated, but there have been some great studies by Rando who has shown that the, the sperm at the top of the epididymis loses many of its RNAs and small vesicles, epididymosomes, exosomes that come from the epididymis, fuse with the sperm, modify the sperm, so that epigenetic imprinting is added to the sperm as the sperm is moving through the epididymis. And remarkably, if you take sperm from the top of the epididymis from uh, the, the, the uh, kaput side, you won't make offspring, but lower down at the cauda side, it will. And so there, there is a maturation occurring here. Um, there is an article in the uh, New York Times a couple days ago, can we really inherit trauma? And the answer is, is debatable, but let, let me just end my talk on two points. One is, I want to suggest that we can improve natural ART. I think we want to mirror nature, and one way to mirror nature would be to see if we can induce capacitation and the acrosome reaction before we do ICSI. I think it would also be great if we could develop some rigorous biological criteria for selecting the sperm for ICSI. And if we can use ejaculated sperm, it would be best. But if we can't, we should use caudal epididymal sperm, not kaput. And ironically, testicular sperm works better than, um, than kaput sperm. I think if we can avoid round spermatids, we're better off. We need to understand more about imprinting. We need to evaluate multi-generational consequences. And one thing that the sperm does that I didn't mention is help in determining polarity. So when you look at me, there's a top and a bottom and a left and a right and a belly and a back. And we know in many animals that the polarity of the organism, the biological axes, the body axes, are set up both by gravity, because we're all growing in a 1G environment. However, if Elon Musk and the Amazon guy and all these others get us to the Mars, we may need to reevaluate what, what development is like in less than one gravity. And the other thing that plays a role in breaking the symmetry is the site of sperm entry. Now, it's not entirely clear in mammals how polarity is established, but if the site of sperm entry is crucial, then the site of ICSI injection may be setting up a position for establishing those body axes. And it's very hard to understand those body axes without interfering with the embryo. And what I want to show you now is um, a movie that was just put together from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And it's using a new type of microscope called a light sheet 
microscope. And if I can have the sound on, and wait, let me turn on the sound myself here. Um, okay, I have the sound. I just need to plug it in. Which one is it? Ah, thank you very much. Oops. And this video is great, and one current slide. What happened here? Uh, let me do this again. Um, and so what you're going to see is a new type of microscope. It, it's a light sheet microscope. It's really quite different than um, even the ones you can buy commercially. And it will be explained in the video. And it will allow us to see how the body axes develop. And... ...to the dynamic growth and optical properties of the embryo. This self-adaption keeps the embryo focused and centered in the field of view. With these new capabilities, we can image mouse development from the symmetry-breaking event of gastrulation through the organogenesis some two days later at the high spatiotemporal resolution required to track individual cell behavior. We can visualize different developmental processes as they occur, such as heart development, neural tube closure, or the formation of the notochord. In order to analyze and quantify these developmental processes and make comparisons between embryos, we developed a computation framework to handle the large and complex image data generated by the light sheet microscope, including a machine learning framework that uses a convolutional neural network to automatically detect cell divisions in the 4D image data. We are able to track individual cells from the beginning to the end of our movies by combining our cell tracking framework, TGMM, with a statistical vector flow technique that is accurate to within two to three cell diameters over the entire time series. Using this method, we have generated the first dynamic cell fate maps during mouse gastrulation and can measure cell population dynamics and systematically trace the origins of individual cells or tissue types with an unprecedented level of detail and precision. A quantitative statistical analysis of normal development requires the comparison of multiple embryos which in the mouse can be challenging due to the dramatic differences in size, shape, and cell number, even between embryos of the same developmental stage. We developed a framework we call TARDIS for registering multiple developing embryos in space and time, which allows us to make direct quantitative comparisons between individuals. By combining our high-resolution data of development for multiple registered embryos, we created an average embryo. This approach reveals the average developmental trajectory of the mouse embryo, quantifies the degree of variability in normal development, and the ability of the embryo to adjust to different conditions, enables statistical cell fate prediction, and detailed automated comparisons between normal and mutant embryos. Finally, to facilitate access to this information for the scientific community, we have made all these methods and resources, including the computational framework, the microscope itself, the image data, our reconstructions and analysis, and the average embryo freely and publicly available. So th this work is going to, to change uh, the way we look at development because you can follow cells individually. What's also remarkable is using genetically identical mice. Every embryo you would say should be identical. They see an enormous amount of variation from embryo to embryo. So it's no wonder that in your clinics, where you have people coming from all different backgrounds, you see variations in embryos because there's huge variations already in, in things that shouldn't have much variation. And so let me stop there, and I do think this sperm does have a role in facilitating fertilization. Mm -hmm.